you. Thank you very much. In our first session that we had, if you remember, I made reference to an experience that I had as a college student, which I called a catalytic moment, a moment of powerful effect on my life that changed the whole future course of my existence. It's defined my life, tells me who I am and what I'm about and all of that. But I have to confess to you that one of the immediate results of my conversion to Christianity was that for the first year of my Christian life, I was almost, not totally, but almost totally brain dead. Because <laughs> I fell in love with Jesus. And the only thing that I wanted to know anything about was Jesus. And I had to be a freshman in college. And the college professors and the dean had other ideas. They had other things they wanted me to learn about. And I said, I don't care about biology. I don't care about sociology. I don't care about psychology. All I want to know is Jesus. And so what I did was I read the Bible. And that's just about all I read for a year. Except I would go to this Christian bookstore in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and I would buy books about the Bible. So the only thing I read was the Bible and books about the Bible. And my report card showed that. At the end of the first semester, I got an A in gym because I was on a football scholarship, and you got an automatic A because you didn't have to take gym, but it was only one credit course, and each credit was worth three uh, points uh, if you got an A. So I got three points for the A. And I got an A in Bible was a two-credit course. So I had three credits worth of A's my freshman year, my first semester. And all the rest were D's, and the D's gave you Zippo points. And if you only had uh, two points at the end of the first semester where I went to college, you're out of there. You're history. You flunk out. But I had three, and I made the dean's list. Not the good dean's list, but the probation list, but I was able to stay another semester. But I kept up the same practice. And all I wanted to do was talk to people about Jesus. I wanted to be an evangelist. I went back and I told all my friends about what happened to me. And they thought I lost it. They thought I was beside myself or something. But it didn't dampen my enthusiasm. I wanted to tell the world because I had experience something that was the most powerful, the most real, the most catalytic experience of my life. But I was completely hostile to education other than the Bible. Until I had my second catalytic experience. And it happened that the college had a requirement that you had to fulfill so many courses in lab science, non-lab sciences, and social sciences, and all that. And to fulfill one of these requirements, I was required to take a course called the Introduction to Philosophy. You talk about dry. <laughs> you know, the first thing we read, some of you have been through college, you understand, the very first assignment was to read David Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding, which human understanding I had none whatsoever about what this guy was talking about. And empirical data this, and sense perception that, and, and uh, simple ideas. I said, ah, they're not so simple to me. I don't, I don't understand what this guy's talking about. The next thing we read was Immanuel Kant. And I got even more confused. And I said, this is ridiculous. And so what I did was I went to the class every day, or every other day, and I had ordered through the mail printed uh, sermons in pamphlets of Billy Graham. And I used to sit in the last row, and I'd, and I'd have my notebook back there, and I'd sit way in the back of the class, and I'd prop up my notebook, and inside my notebook I had these sermons from Billy Graham. So the teacher wouldn't know that I was ignoring him, and I was reading Billy Graham's sermons because they were all about Jesus. And that's all I wanted to know anything about. So I was, my mind was sleeping. 
My soul was awake to God, but my mind was still asleep. And then one afternoon, and this professor, I have to tell the truth, was very soft-spoken, very boring. There wasn't a whole lot of passion in his teaching style to get anybody excited about what he was talking about. But this one afternoon, he began to lecture on the philosophy of Aurelius Augustine, Saint Augustine. And he was teaching us Augustine's philosophical understanding of the creation of the universe. And against my will, I was drawn to listen. I didn't pick up my pen to take notes. I wasn't that committed. But I, I closed my notebook with the Billy Graham sermon and started listening. And I heard the professor in his soft-spoken voice begin to tell about how Augustine conceived of the majesty of power that was exhibited and manifested in a being who could bring a universe into existence by the sheer force of his command. He was talking about a God so transcendently powerful that he could simply say, let there be light. The lights came on. And as he went through the aspects of this sermon, my soul was kindled anew. And my mind came awake. And I said, I must learn more about this God who is so powerful, so great, so majestic. And I'm an impulsive person. After that class, I went right downstairs, went directly to the registrar's office, and changed my major from Bible to philosophy. Not because I wanted to study philosophy that badly, but I wanted to study under that teacher. God used that man to awaken me to a brand new understanding of who God is. He woke me up from my dogmatic slumbers. And he explained to me, you haven't found God yet. This is just the beginning, your conversion. Your whole life has to be defined by a pursuit of a knowledge of God and of a relationship with God. It just starts when you're converted. It doesn't end there. It was Jesus who said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. Now here's another question for you. And you have to answer this honestly in your own mind, because some people are going to answer this yes, and I don't want you to raise your hand, because I don't want to embarrass anybody. Some people are going to say yes to this question, and some people are going to say no. But here's my question. Have you ever, ever, ever in your life had an intense, vivid, powerful sense of the presence of God? Have you ever had that? You know, the funny thing is, the vast majority of people whom I ask that question don't even hesitate to say to me, Yes, I've had it. It's rare. It's infrequent. But yes, I've tasted it. Yes, I've had it. Yes, I've had those moments where the presence of God was so powerful, so real, that you could cut it with a knife. But if you answered yes to that question, my next question is somewhat provocative. What happened? It's a question I ask myself. 
because I don't sense the presence of God vividly and clearly and powerfully every minute of my life or even every day of my life. Even though I have been awakened to a sense of the majesty of God, I go back to sleep and I need to be awakened. And that which I want to be awakened is to the character of God, to the holiness of God. For those of you who answered yes to my question, where you sensed the presence of God coming close. What was it like? How did you feel? What did you sense? What were your emotions? What were your thoughts? Again, I've asked that question where people do have the opportunity to respond in writing or uh, speaking. And here's the kinds of things they'll say to me. They'll say, it was eerie. Or they'll say, it was scary. Or they'll say, it was dreadful. It was awful. Nobody's ever said to me, it was boring. And yet everybody tells me the church is boring. And if God isn't boring and church is boring, the only thing I can understand, the only thing I can figure out is somehow we're not meeting God. We're asleep in church. God's not asleep. God never sleeps. God's there. I'm there. But we don't connect. I don't touch Him. I don't sense Him. Because I'm asleep. Some people say, yeah, I know the experience when I have that experience, it's wonderful, it's sweet. I feel a sense or a wave of calmness or peace flooding over my body. However we describe it, the one thing that we know is that that experience, and this, this is for, if you've never had that experience, then you really need to listen. The one thing about that experience is it is different. It is different from our normal, daily, common sensibilities, isn't it? Why is it different? The chief answer to that question is because God is different. That's why we have so much trouble with God. He's different. He's not like me. Oh, he's some way in which we're alike, but the contrasts are unbelievable. He is so high, so great, so transcendent, so beautiful, so majestic, that he differs from anything I've ever experienced in this world. When I was a kid, the first prayer I ever learned, I wasn't a believer, I wasn't a Christian, but I happened to be in a religious family and so on, and they insisted that we have table graces at every meal. And my grandmother, who lived with us, made me memorize this little grace, and I had to be the one that say it every night at the table. A dining room table would be set, and we'd have all the food ready to go, and they'd say, okay, Sonny, that's what they call me, So, okay, Sonny, say the prayer. And I would recite the prayer, and it went like this. Maybe you know it. God is great. Huh? You ever heard this one? God is good, and we thank Him for this food. I couldn't put that together. This was supposed to be a rhyme. You know, my grandmother said, God is great, God is good, and we thank Him for this food. <laughs> It rhymed, but uh, nobody else called fo food food, but she did. But in any case, that was my introduction to prayer. It was also my introduction to theology, because it was saying two things to me about God. It told me that God was great, 
And it told me that God was good. And I remember when I studied theology seriously that I came upon a word that I began to study, I began to examine, I looked up its roots, I looked it up in the Hebrew, I looked it up in the Greek, I, I looked it up in the lexicon of the theologians and so on, and I discovered that this one word that the Bible uses all the time points both to God's greatness and to His goodness. And that word is holy. And I've come to discover that the most basic, most fundamental characteristic of God, the most basic attribute that defines who He is, is His holiness. The angels sing in His presence every day, holy, holy, holy. When Jesus taught His disciples to pray, the first thing He taught them to pray about was what? He said, when you pray, I want you to say, I want you to say, Our Father who art in heaven, that's the address. And then I want you to ask Him this, Hallowed be Thy name. I want you to pray that my Father's name will be regarded as holy. I want people to wake up to who my Father is. I want people to understand that He is holy and that He will never negotiate His holiness. He will never stop being holy. He loves to be holy. And He hates everything that isn't holy. But the people down here are sound asleep and they have no regard, no reverence, no worship, no adoration, no praise for His holiness. Instead, they hold His holiness in contempt and trample it into the ground. They use His name to curse. And they say, God isn't holy. He forgives everybody without repentance, without satisfaction, without atonement. I don't need Jesus. And people who say that are absolutely right if God is not holy. Some people can't stand the idea that God is holy. I have a, you know, a video series, six lectures, on, just on the holiness of God. And people will start Bible study groups in their communities across the country, and they'll invite their friends from the neighborhood to come in and say, come on, watch this video program. What are we going to watch? The holiness of God. Ah, oh, come on, you know. And of all the things we've ever done at Ligonier, this is the most provocative series we've ever done. And I get letters every day from people who say, man, when I started to think about the holiness of God, it blew my mind. And then I get somebody called and said, I had my neighbors come in to watch the holiness of God, and in the middle, two of them got up and walked out, and they're mad, and they won't talk to me anymore. I said, you want to divide people in a hurry. You want to disrupt your neighborhood. You focus your attention on the holiness of God. Because nobody's neutral about it. You either hate it, or you love it. If you want a quick and dirty answer to the state of your soul, again, ask yourself inside where nobody's looking, do I delight in the holiness of God? If you don't, you are spiritually dead. You may be in a church, you may be in a Christian school, but if there's no delight in your soul for the holiness of God, you don't know God. You don't love God. You're out of touch with God. 
you're asleep to his character. But then you ask yourself this question, do I want him to be holy? Well, yes and no. Remember I said that his holiness refers to his greatness and to his goodness. To his awesome, transcendent, majestic power and being and to his absolute purity. Well, let me, let me say this. The reason why we can delight in God at all is because he's holy. Think about it. Think if the highest being in the universe were all-powerful, omnipotent, powerful enough to put galaxies in their places, omniscient, able to know everything, to read your mind, to know everything that you've ever done, every thought that you've ever thought, every word that you've ever uttered. He knows it all. Think of a being all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent, infinite, eternal, self-existent, immutable, never going to stop being all-powerful, never going to stop being all-knowing, never going to stop being all-present. Imagine a being that is all those things, but not good. How would you like to have in a li live in a universe ruled by an all-powerful, all-evil God? Be unbearable. Our only hope is that this universe is governed by an all-powerful, all-holy who will never, ever, 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 ever use his power in an unholy way, in a bad way, who knows everything that you've ever done and everything you've ever done and everything you've ever thought and everything you've ever said, but who'll never, ever use that knowledge in an unholy way. We've confided in our friends the deepest secrets of our souls and trusted them with our lives. And they use that knowledge against us, to wound us. But you see, the reason why God is praiseworthy, that is, worthy of our praise, is because He is holy. He is great. And he is good. I was in seminary. I was given the assignment to teach a group of high school kids in the church. And I said, I'll lecture to those kids and see how it goes. And I went. And I loved high school kids. I wasn't that far removed from being one myself, you know, and all that. And uh, went in there. I said, I, I'll never forget what it's like to be a teenager. I'll, I'll always remember. I'll always be able to relate. I'll never be out of it and all that. And I went in and I said, here's the subject of our discussion this afternoon. Why you hate God. Whoa! <laughs> I almost got killed at that thing. I, they ate my lunch. I walked out of there and I said, hey, I'm never talking to high school kids again as long as I live. They got so mad at me, so hostile, because I suggested to them that their basic human nature was a nature that at its root, at the core of its heart, was hostile to God. And they insisted that they were never, ever hostile towards God. That they never hated God. They were hostile to me, they said, but they weren't hostile to God. By nature, the Bible said, you are the sworn enemy of the Almighty. The Bible says that our fall is so great, our corruption so profound, that we will not have God in our thoughts. Our minds are reprobate. We don't want to think about God. 
God is loathsome to us in His holiness. And I say that to people and they say, I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I hate God. I'm just indifferent. How does God regard your indifference but as contempt for His very being? To be indifferent to me is to insult me, isn't it? And God says, this people hates me. And part of their hatred is seen as that they say they don't. They deny that they hate Him. Why? Because they really believe they don't hate God for this reason. By the time I got to these high school kids, they had already spent all the years of their life reshaping, restructuring, and redefining God. They would already stripped God of His holiness. They would already taken away His justice. They would already removed His wrath. And they had conjured up a God who was only love, only kindness, only mercy, only grace. He was a cosmic bellhop that you call by pressing a button when you need Him. He never sends anybody to hell. He never makes absolute demands upon your life. He just willy-nilly forgives you all the time. And they said, we don't hate God. Well, who would hate a God like that? But the very fact that their God that they said they weren't hate was already a substitute, an idol for the real God, revealed the depth of their hostility to the God who is. Don't make any mistake about this. Your basic nature is to hate the God who made you. And even conversion doesn't get rid of that altogether. You're an idol factory. You have as much drive and tendencies within you, if you're a Christian today, towards idolatry, you know, as, as you can imagine. Christians run from the holiness of God. Christians run from the sovereignty of God. They don't want a God who's sovereign except when they need something. And there's a reason for this. Because the greatest enemy, beloved, to sin is holiness. Let me say it again. The greatest enemy of sin is holiness, and we understand that. We understand that if God is holy, we're in trouble. Because we're not holy, and we know it. That's why we want to push God out of our minds. The two things we don't like to think about. His holiness, our sin. And we'll be tied the prophet or the preacher who wakes us up to either one of them. We don't want that. But if you want life, we're going to have to face both of those things. As we bring this series to a close on choosing my religion, I'd like to have just a brief epilogue with those of you who have been watching it on video. Because in a real sense, uh, what's happening here is that you have been spectators to these uh, discussions. And now I'd like to get beyond the business of uh, being a spectator and, as it were, get in your face for just a second. There are two concepts here that we've been talking about that I think are extremely important, not in the abstract, but right where we live. And those two are the holiness of God and the return of the prodigal son to the Father. Now, I know that in my experience, before I ever became a Christian, before I ever read the Bible, before I ever studied any theology of any sort, I already knew that God is holy. And I think you know that. Now, the way I knew it wasn't through theology. I knew it every time I sinned. 
because when I experienced a sense or an awareness of what I was doing was wrong, I knew it was wrong because God is holy. And I'm not talking here about guilt trips or guilt feelings. I'm talking about something real. I'm talking about real guilt, real sin. That's a reality of my life, and I know it's a reality of your life. And that leaves us with the question, what do we do about it? I mean, one of the most difficult problems that anybody ever has to deal with is the question, what do I do personally with my guilt? Not with somebody else's, not with my parents, not with my friends, but with me. And that's what the story of, of the prodigal son is all about. I, I've experienced that in my life. I know what it means to come back from the pig pen. I know what it means to to fall on my face before God, and I know what it means to have God reach down and put His arms around me like the Father did the Son, and to put a robe on me, and to bring me to the banquet feast. And what I care most about all of the things we're, we're talking about here is that you have that same experience. Because when we do sin, there's a real sense in which we are left naked. And we need to be covered. And the provision that God has made for that is the cross. We've all heard about the cross in the abstract. And we can be spectators of the cross in the abstract. But for us to understand what it means to be in the Father's house, something personal has to take place. We talk nebulously about faith, but what, what I mean by faith is this, that we put our personal trust in Christ and in Christ alone to cover us. That He alone can bring us back into fellowship with a God who is holy. Because He supplies what we need. I'm not righteous. And you're not righteous in and of yourself. But Christ lived a life of perfect righteousness. And He has given that righteousness to any person who will embrace Him in faith and put their trust in Him. And that's a major step in anybody's life. I think it's the most significant decision a person ever makes, is to get it settled, to get it settled with God, to deal with this problem of being naked before His holiness. And so my prayer for you is that you won't put your head on the pillow of the night until you get it settled between you and God by coming to the cross personally, privately, and embracing the one whom God has provided as your Savior and as your Redeemer. Because He is called the Savior because He saves. And He's called the Redeemer because He redeems. Christ and Christ alone, of all of the religions in the world, of all the philosophies in the world, only Christ has made an atonement. And that's what we need if we are to be redeemed. My prayer for you is that when we have the great banquet feast with the Father, and when He gives the signet ring to His sons and to His daughters, that you will be there, clothed and forgiven and redeemed.